And so actually, when we think about God, God is referred to in the Bible by a lot of different things. He has a lot of different names and a lot of different titles. And they're very specific because they tell us different things about him and his character and what he does. Um, there's so many to get into. We're not going to get into all of them, but a couple of examples. One would be Je- um, Jehovah Jireh, which means that he's the God who provides. Jehovah Shalom, that he's the God of peace. El Shaddai, that he is God Almighty. He's referred to as Adonai, when master or Lord. Elohim, meaning the talking about his strength and his power. But one of the most commonly ref- common terms that he's referred to throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament, is that of Father. He's called God the Father. I know for some of us, when you hear the word Father, that brings up great memories. That brings up a smile to your face. Uh, even the idea of how some of these kids reacted to their dads, like that's the kind of reaction that you give. But for some of us, the, it's an opposite reaction. The idea of hearing Father doesn't bring those memories. And it's a difficult thing to hear uh, because maybe you didn't have a good example or it was a horrible example. And so the idea of thinking of God as Father is a difficult thing to get your mind around. And so in that, that's what I want to talk about today, the significance of God as Father, because it's important for us to grasp the reality of Him as Father so that we can understand who He is on his own terms, and not based on what we've known. Because whether we've had bad experiences or great experiences, God is the perfect father. And we need to know the type of father that he is. And so again, there's so much that I could say, but a couple key things I want to hone in on. First, that he is mighty and in control. God the Father is mighty and in control. Now, we might not respond positively hearing that somebody else is in control, but it's a good thing that God is in control. He is God and we are not. And Scripture speaks to his power and his might. Specifically, Psalm 95 says this, For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. You hear the language there of how he's made all of creation. There isn't one element, uh, the highest of heights, the the deepest of depths, all from the east to the west, everything. He has made it, and it's under his control. And his people are under his care. In the book of Job, after Job and his friends go back and forth with all of these questions and dialogues about God and what God is like, finally God speaks. And the last couple chapters of the book of Job is God speaking and everyone being quiet and listening. There's a couple of key phrases in there, where verses in there where, in, for example, in Job 38, God says this, Who is this darkening counsel with words lacking knowledge? God talking about Job. Prepare yourself like a man. I will interrogate you and you will respond to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In Job 40, he says, prepare yourself like a man. I will interrogate you and you will respond to me. Would you question my justice? Deem me guilty so that you can be innocent. Over these powerful chapters, God's talking about his power, his might, his control, that he is the one over the universe and we are under his care. We don't always understand his wisdom. We don't under, always understand his rule, which that, the, the scripture doesn't hide that reality. In fact, in Isaiah 55, it says, my, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are, not beyond, are beyond anything that you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts." He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is in control. He is the mighty God, powerful. And thank goodness that 
He is God and not us. Thankful that He is God and He is God with us. Because that's the reality, this mighty God, this God who's in control, this God who's over all of the universe and the bigness of the universe is present right in the midst of my life. And the significance of that, well, Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for God, you are with me. And 1 Peter 5, he says to the church, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. And then it says in Psalm 118, The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? He is the God who is with us. When my kids were growing up, and even now, if they were scared, hey, can, can you come and lay down with me? Can, you, can I lay down with you? When they, were go, when they were hurt, they would run to me, Dad, help, Dad, Dad, help. When there was a problem at school, they knew that they had a dad who would go to bat for them and defend them and be there for them. And even those little things that I've done for them are only a hint at the bigness of all that God has done for us. And that's the thing, is you look at your dad and you might think, man, all of this was awesome, but God is perfect. And you might look at your dad and go, he was none of those things. Well, then be thankful that God is perfect because this all-knowing, all-powerful, in-control God is present with you. He is powerful, he is almighty, he is present, and we are never alone. You are never alone because that God who is everywhere is right where you are. You are not alone. Now even know that even though things might seem like they're out of control, God is always in control. It's one thing to know about his might. It's one thing to know about his ability. But we also not need to know what he's like. And that's equally important. That's the second thing. He is mighty and he's in control. And second, he is good. He is good. It's important for us to know he's in control, but it's also important for us to realize that he is not a tyrant. God is not a tyrant. He is good, perfectly, completely, thoroughly good. Psalm says, Psalm 119 says, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. And in many other scriptures, we hear about God, the goodness of God, his heart toward his people. For example, in Matthew 7, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good, good, give good gifts to those who ask him? In Matthew 18, it says, What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones, not willing that you would perish. And Matthew 6 Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? He is a good God, and his goodness, his heart is toward you. God is a good Father it makes me think of a story that Jesus told once about a son who decided to do his own thing. God is almighty, God is in control. But he gives us free will to be able to make choices. And with that, the consequences that will come out of our choices. And so that's the paradox and the reality of how the world works is that God is in control, but he has given us the ability to make decisions and to make choices. And then we see the consequences, good and bad, that come from those choices. So we think about this good God and the choices that we have in the story that Jesus told, there was a father and he had two sons. 
The youngest wanted his share of the inheritance, and he wanted his share of his father's inheritance now so that he could do with it whatever he wanted. And the father let him have it and let him make his choices, and off the son went. As fun as the choices were initially, as great as life was initially, the fun didn't last, and the funds ran out, and reality caught up with the younger son. He couldn't get a job, and he was such a low, desolate place that he was eating with farm animals, with the pigs. He was in a desolate place, and the text says in Luke 15, verse 17, that he came to his senses. He started thinking right, because up until this point, he obviously hadn't been. And he thought of his father. And his thoughts of his father went to the type of man that his father was and the way he treats people, specifically those who work for him. And that, man, if his dad treats his workers like this, maybe I could go back home and get a job and he would treat me with the same goodness that he treats those who work for him. And so he heads back home. But then it says in Luke 15, verse 20, It tells of the father's reaction, and it's one of the most beautiful verses in all of the Bible. It says this, But when the young son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. This is God the Father's heart on display for us. He is the good God that we can run to, but we need to know He is already moving toward us. He is the God who runs to us. A good father runs to their children. And God is the father that runs to us. It's the truth of the cross. That's what the cross is all about. It's the reality of God moving toward us so that we can come home to him. We have to be careful when we hear this story, though, to not be like this younger brother's. We don't want to be like his older brother. And that's the thing we should probably be really concerned about. For some of you, you need to be, put yourself in the, feet of the young, in the place of the younger brother. You need to know that there is nothing that you have done. There is no path that you've been on that when you turn and look to God, he's not running toward you. There is nothing that you have done that would cause him to love you less and not want him, not ca- and would cause him to not want to bring you home. But we also need to really make sure we're not being like the older brother, because really the older brother is what this story is about. The older brother is what this story is warning people about, because the older brother said, look at all that I've done. Look at all that I've accomplished. Why are you celebrating him? And we really need to evaluate our hearts when we think about that older brother. We might not realize our need to run to the Father because of all the things we've done, because of all the things we've accomplished. Don't allow your comfort, your success, your work ethic or anything else blind you to the fact that you need God. You might not be in as low as a place as somebody else like the younger brother, but don't let that blind you to how much you need the Father, how much you need His love, and you're really in the same place as the other one. We just don't realize it when we're blinded by ourselves. We need God's love. We need that relationship with him. We need the life that only he can give. Don't miss that because you're blinded by yourself. Know today that God is good. He loves you perfectly and he wants to be in a relationship with you, which leads to the last thing. He is mighty in control, he is good, and he is the source of life. My kids and I were in the theater a couple years ago, and we were watching the movie Teen Titans Go. And at the very end, it's a cartoon, total kid movie, uh, family movie, but at the end of this, 
one of the characters at the very, very end, one of the characters gets right up in the screen and said, kids, ask your parents where babies, then you can finish that in case people are watching with you. We hadn't had that conversation yet with my kids, so my eyes bugged out of my face. I'm super ticked at this movie, and I immediately start talking like a six-year-old, like, hey, wasn't that awesome? What was your favorite part? How did you think about this? What did you think about that? And just talking nonstop to distract my kids, because we hadn't had that talk with my son yet, and so it's like I want to distract him from anything, and eventually he forgot about that, and we just were talking about the movie. But it was not a good moment in that last couple seconds. Nevertheless, that conversation happens. We get the talk at some point. When we think about the reality, though, about becoming a child of God, it's not a natural birth. It's an adoption. To become a child of God, there's an adoption that happens. John 5, verses 21 and 26 say, For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted the same life-giving power to his Son. These verses are important because they speak to the intimate relationship between the Father and the Son within the Trinity. How the, the Father and the Son are so intimately bound. They are self-existent, eternally alive, and life comes from them. It's further important for us today when we think about this, because when we talk about God and life, it is described in terms within this Father-Son relationship. The eternal life seen in the Father and the Son is offered to others. The eternal, self-sustaining life, self-efficient life that they have is offered. Eternal life is offered to those who would follow him. But think about that, though. God, Jesus, offers life to those who are already alive. The Father offers life to those who are already alive. Because without God, we're not really living. We're basically dead, walking dead. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death. We've all messed up. We've all seen the reality of sin in our life and the brokenness that it causes. And in that, we are dead. We are separated. We're not one with God in that state. But the mighty God who is in control and who is good came to us, did the work necessary to take care of our sins so that we could come and be part of his family. Galatians 4 says, but at, when the right time came, God the Father sent his son Jesus, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Daddy, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and in his resurrection, it's possible for us to go from separated from God, dead in our sins, to being with him, in his family, become adopted as his children. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead defeated sin. And it's how we are given new life. How we become, enter into that life as his kids. The heavenly father becomes our father. J.I. Packer, a, a famous theologian, has written a lot of books. He said, to the extent that you make much of being a son or daughter of the living God, that's the extent to which you understand the gospel. When we understand the reality of what God has done to bring us into the family, to make us as 
not with him to being able to be called his sons and daughters. When we grasp that, then we understand the good news. Then we understand the gospel. Then we understand what Jesus came to earth for. Not just so that we can have one moment where we say, forgive me, and then that's it. But a moment where who we are is changed and transformed, where we get a new identity as part of his family, as his children. He is our father. That's not automatic. It's not automatic. You have to trust him. You have to trust him. I think about the people that I know who have adopted and all of the process that it takes, the huge process that it takes. And at the very end, the child's saying, I want to go home with you. God has done all of the work on the cross. He has done everything that's necessary. But you have to put your faith in him. It says in John 5, 24, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. When you believe that this is true, not just in your mind, but in your heart, I, I'm giving my life to you. I'm aligning who I am with God so that I can be his child. And you have to know that you've done that. It's not just, well, I've always believed, or even the idea of growing up in a household where your parents trusted Jesus. This is something that you have to do. You have to put your faith in Jesus. It's a very somber passage in the Gospels where Matthew says, uh, in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There's going to be a lot of people at the end who say, you know what, well, I've, I grew up in a home like this, or I did really good things, or I wasn't as bad as this person, or I, I showed up for church once a month and helped out a little bit. None of, that thing, none of those things gives us a relationship with God. Aligning myself, putting my faith in Him, trusting Him with everything that I am, that's what gives me a relationship with God. Have you done that? Have you committed yourself to him? Because if not, let today be the day on Father's Day that God becomes your father. He is mighty and in control. He is good. He is the source of life. This is the God that he is. This is the father that he is. He is the father who sees us where we are has compassion toward us, runs to us, throws his arms around us with love and affection, wanting us, wanting you, and wanting you to be home. He is God the Father. Let him be your Father today. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the fact that you are good, that you are in control, that you give us life. God, I pray that you would remind us of these truths. If somebody's listening to this and they're already following you, let it be a reminder to them, an encouragement to them, a hope for them, a realignment for them, that they would focus who they are on you. Anyone who doesn't know you, God, let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day that they put their faith, they put their trust in you. Let today be the day that they're not dead, but alive because they've trusted you, the God who gives life. God, I pray you would encourage our hearts. Let us know that we're not alone. Let us know that we can run to you. Let us know that only in you we have life. We are so grateful for your love for us. We're so grateful for your care for us. I pray, God, you would encourage hearts with the truth of who you are. In your name we pray, amen. And we think about the God that he is. We think about his love and care for us. Let's sing this last song together, knowing that this is God's heart toward you.